So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, how the hippocampus, we think, works in primates and humans, including humans, uh, today. I'll be talking a little bit about computational neuroscience. And what I want to say for all you keen people is um, <clears throat> I wrote some programs to illustrate the principles of operation of the basic networks that I'll be talking about, attractor networks and pattern associators and competitive nets. And those programs are written in MATLAB and are available with this book, but all the programs are on my website. So if anyone wants to um, <clears throat> try the programs uh, this week, I'll be very happy, you see, to discuss with people what's happening in the programs. And that's the real way to try to understand exactly what these networks are doing, okay? Um, if you don't have MATLAB on your computer, there's um, a freeware called Octave, which will also load the same programs, and you can just load that up onto your computer very easily, okay? So, I'm um, <coughs> gonna be talking then about um, how we think the hippocampus works. Uh, particularly in primates, and um, I'm going to be emphasizing um, its probable function in episodic memory, at least in event memory, and storing and recalling individual events. And I'll be emphasizing things like pattern separation and pattern completion. Um, what I'd like to do is just um, here to, to acknowledge um, collaborators on this work and uh, some of them include Fabian Grabenhorst and also uh, Shang, who helped uh, with some of the hippocampal recordings. And then particularly, I'd like to acknowledge Alessandro Treves. And here's a message I'd like to give to you all. So basically, I'm a neuroscientist, a neurophysiologist and fMRI person. Alessandro is a theoretical physicist. Uh, we were able to make some progress in understanding how the hippocampus might work uh, by working together, by collaborative effort. And he did a lot of very, very good quantitative stuff and brought the sort of work that Haim was talking about yesterday to bear on how the hippocampus works. So interdisciplinary collaboration is essential, um, at least at this stage of our knowledge, for understanding the brain. So I'd encourage all of you um, in that direction. Right, now let's get into the science. Um, so the first thing to tell you is that um, when people started studying memory, they thought, well, let's use recognition. Can you recognize a visual stimulus? Turned out that's nothing to do with the hippocampus. This is, was discovered by a whole series of works by Mort Mishkin and others, um, who in the end showed that recognition memory, have I seen something before or recently, is perirhinal cortex, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so lesions of perirhinal cortex affect just whether you can recognize a stimulus. Um, and so I'd just like to mention to you what um, perirhinal cortex is doing. Here it is, down here at the base of the temporal lobe. Um, <clears throat> we discovered some neurons there which are quite interesting because they represent uh, long-term familiarity. Can I just check, can you all hear me at the back? Yeah? Yes, can you hear me at the back? Someone nod, no. good, okay, right. So here's what happened. Um, these are days and we presented stimuli for um, hundreds of times in a short-term memory task. We weren't interested in long-term memory. But here's what happened, the neuronal response gradually increased over 10 days of testing and 100 presentations of the stimuli to the set of stimuli that we were using. And then we thought, well, that's interesting. So we started off with a new set of stimuli. And the same happened. It gradually built up um, a familiarity response. Just the, the very first, yes. it was a totally novel stimulus from, on trial one? Um, probably, yes. Um, OK, so long-term familiarity memory is in the perirhinal cortex. There is a representation. What use would it be for? Well, um, perhaps in evolution, you want to know which is your family, where your house is, where your territory is. You would get a familiarity signal. But perirhinal cortex is also involved in short-term memory. So we had a running recognition task. Uh, you would present four stimuli in a sequence, and uh, if the monkey saw a repetition in that sequence of a stimulus, so it would be sort of a familiar one, then he had to do something. And here's what happened. 
um, the neurons respond the first time that the monkey has seen a particular stimulus in that set of four, and the second time um, the neuron responds much less, all these neurons do. So basically what this is doing is solving a short-term recognition memory task. So notice there are two sorts of memory being implemented in perirhinal cortex, a short-term recognition one with bigger responses to novel than to familiar stimuli um, over a set of about four. And these neurons reset at the start of every new trial. So even though it's the same set of stimuli, um, if I presented, um, for example, this stimulus at the start of the next sequence of four, even though the monkey might have seen it quite recently, the system would reset and we would get a large response to that particular stimulus, okay? So this is actively involved in working memory. So we've dealt with a recognition memory. Now on to hippocampus, lesions in humans affect memory. Here's the circuit we're going to talk about. What I told you yesterday very briefly in the discussion is that what's especially interesting about the hippocampus down here is that it receives from parietal cortex and temporal cortex. So this is where and what and prefrontal cortex. So it's one of the few bits of the brain that can put together um, parietal spatial information with other things in terms of its anatomy. And all of these things come down through parahippocampal gyrus and perirhinal in primates to entorhinal cortex, which projects onto dentate CA3, CA1. And what I'll be showing you is that this bit of the brain, CA3, has a single network. It's the only part of the brain with a single network that could receive from the whole of, say, large swathes of neocortex, including parietal and temporal. And that's one of the things that makes it special in memory. Now, the system has to undergo synaptic modification. So here we have um, a postsynaptic neuron. Um, and if we provide a set of inputs here, we exceed um, a th firing threshold here so that we have conjunctive pre- and postsynaptic firing, the synapses increase. Now here's something that um, is important. Um, it's uh, heterosynaptic long-term depression. So when Heim was talking yesterday about a covariance rule, the part of it that's important for memory storage is this bit. What this says is if I have a strong input um, to a neuron and it forces postsynaptic firing, then that synapse will increase. But at the same time, um, if I have an inactive input on other synapses, that will decrease. So that is the mechanism or one of the mechanisms of forgetting. Okay? If I had learned something on this previously, but now I present a new stimulus that activates that, then this synapse will get weaker, and so I'm overwriting previous memories. That's the palimpsest, so-called idea. A palimpsest is the document that you can write over repeatedly, okay? So um, that's the crucial bit of the covariance rule. For those of you into neural networks, what it does is to remove the mean of the presynaptic activity from the Hebb rule. Okay, now, what does happen in primates? It's totally different to the rat, okay? So here's the first thing that we discovered in the monkey now, <coughs> set of neurons that respond to whole body motion, okay? So what's happening here is we have a monkey sitting on a French robot uh, in a collaboration with Alain Bertos, and if we uh, rotate the whole body in one direction, for example, clockwise, then this neuron responds. Um, and if we rotate it in the other direction, there's no response at all. So this is whole body motion. Uh, these cells were rediscovered by the Mosers and published as speed cells in the rat, but they're the same thing. Um, some of those cells um, res respond not to angular whole body rotation, which they haven't discovered yet, um, <laughs> but uh, they respond to linear motion, okay? So some of them respond if we drive the robot sort of like this, but not when it's going backwards, okay? So there's linear motion as well. Okay, the next thing we discovered was something totally unexpected. Um, <clears throat> basically, we started showing stimuli to a monkey on a screen, 
and we had wondered if we'd get place cells or something like that, place cell responding when I'm in a particular place. But look, this neuron increases its firing rate only for, the, for stimuli in the top left of our television monitor. Okay? The monkey was doing a sort of object place recognition memory task. If a stimulus had appeared a second time in a particular location, then he could uh, make a lick to get fruit juice. So he was having to remember where stimuli had been seen. But this neuron just responds to a place out there in the world, totally unprecedented in terms of um, rat place cells. So then we started testing our monkeys in the whole laboratory. So here's our laboratory, electrophysiological apparatus, a door, and this whole distance is probably about five meters square. If we have the monkey in this location and he's looking towards the door here, we get a big firing rate. If he's in this place and looks in that direction, we get no firing rate. If the monkey's in this place looking towards the door, we get a big firing rate, but not if he looks there and uh, so on, if the monkey's here. So what's common to all these things? Well, it looks as if it's the place where the monkey's looking. So at this moment, uh, we were just moving the monkey around to different locations in the environment, and we discovered uh, <clears throat> what seemed to be some cells coding for places out there, and we called them spatial view cells. Uh, Bruce McNaughton then said, well, look, place cells only ever respond when a rat is running round. Uh, you, yeah, you better get your monkey running round. So we accepted the challenge. Um, the way we did it technically is to take our primate chair and just tip it forward, and then the monkey's legs stuck out onto the ground, and he could run around at great speed often, <laughs> just as fast as a dog. And then when he calmed down a bit, um, <clears throat> we could uh, measure the firing rates. Quick question. Yeah, um, how do you know it's, so it's tracking to the place and not in, for example, the landmark? Or Okay, don't worry for a minute. Um, <laughs> you'll see a bit more data. Okay, so here's the monkey now in our three meters times three meters part of the room. And uh, Sylvia Worth showed you this yesterday. This neuron is responding when the monkey looks at this location. Each dot is a spike of the neuron on those outside locations. Doesn't matter where the monkey is. Um, so it's not a place cell. Um, <coughs> Hmm. Now, how are these cells coding? Is it head direction? Is it eye position? Eye position is where the eyes are looking in, uh, in your sort of orbit. Um, <clears throat> or is it the place where the monkey is? So what we did is we applied Shannon information theory to the responses of these cells, to the firing rates. What you find is that for allocentric view, where the monkey's looking in the world, uh, we were able to get 0.327 bits of information for, um, on average from a cell. Okay? Uh, that's the maximum information that it provides when you're looking at one particular part of the world. And then if you look at eye position, there's a tiny amount of information, 0.04 bits, a small amount of information about head direction, and a small amount of information about place. So we're not saying these cells only respond to spatial view. Um, there's a little bit of information about some other things, but that's primarily what they're responding to. Okay, in our first publication on this, we actually classed some of our neurons as being spatial view and position. A small proportion of them reflect where you are in space. Okay, right. Um, now, these neurons are involved in memory in a certain sense. So here's our, another neuron recorded with a view field here. Um, we then removed the view field. We did it by placing curtains all the way around here and even by turning off the lights. And uh, we still got the same view field here for a few minutes. Um, after the monkey had been moving around a bit for a few minutes, he got lost and the neurons stopped responding. And we were in there with the monkey and we got lost too and <laughs> had considerable trouble finding our way back out through the curtains. So the point is, 
you do idiothetic update of these neurons. What that means is that self-motion updates where they should be responding to. If you like, you can call it a prediction, but it's only a prediction based on your self-motion. To make it entirely clear what I mean, um, if I close my eyes and walk over here and turn around like this, I might be facing towards the window, and I am, okay? But my spatial view cell, before I opened my eyes, would have been responding, okay? So it's recovering um, and producing a remembered spatial view even. So that's one link into memory. Okay, you can see this if you simply plot the firing rates. So this is uh, 35 degrees plus and minus, um, where the monkey with his head still can look left and right. We're measuring eye position all the time. Um, and what you see here is that um, the neuron has a peak of firing when he's looking, um, here he is, towards that location, towards the workbench, okay? Um, we do the same in the dark, even with the lights out, and we get the same spatial view field, okay? So they work for memory. Now, what on earth are monkeys doing with these spatial view cells? Um, well, we think it's just like a rat place cell, except that monkeys have a different visual system. So a rat has about 270 degrees of vision. Um, I've shown it here as 180 degrees. So if you think of triangulating um, room cues, um, you can work out by a combination of C1, C2, and C3 um, where you are. Um, a primate has a much smaller view field. The fovea probably uh, would extend between 5 and 15 degrees. So the, the visual world of a primate is totally different. And we explore it, not by running round and smelling, which is what rats do, but I can explore the world just by moving my eyes and head, okay? So, uh, if you do the same thing in the monkey, take the combinations of three things, uh, what do you get? Well, you don't get where you are, you get <coughs> where you're looking in space. So I think it may be the same mechanism. We made a model of it, which I'm not going to go into the details of, in, very much, but if you give the model a 270 degrees of view, you get a place field, and if you give it a 30 degrees of view, you then get a spatial view cell. Okay, so the principles of computation may be the same, but because the visual system is different, you get spatial view cells in humans, I believe. Now they haven't yet been discovered very much yet in humans. This is an open field for humans, a major issue that needs to be solved in humans. Um, it would be uh, quite easy to do, in a sense. All you need to do is to have maybe a couple of monitors in a room, and you set up your human so that... Um, it, oh, in fact, I'll show you the task. Um, you, this is what we did in the monkey. We set up our monkey at two monitors, and if the monkey looked at this screen and saw one object, uh, in this case a square, he could get a reward. But if he saw a triangle, he would get a taste of saline. But it's the opposite here. If he sees a square, he gets um, here a taste of saline, and a triangle, he gets a reward. So he can only solve this by doing a combination of an object out there in space. Okay, it's object and place memory to solve the task. So one could try the same in humans and see what would happen. Um, here's what happens in monkeys. Um, <clears throat> you get some cells here which are responding, and this particular cell has object-related activity. So, for example, this cell is responding more to object 2 than it does to object 1, and there's the response compared to that. Um, some cells go to a combination of the object and place. So, in this case, we have a cell that goes with a response to object one in place one, but not to anything else, okay? So um, you find object cells. Now, what's the interesting thing about this? Um, these object cells are pretty messy if the monkey's not doing a memory task. So we did a big study in which we recorded from 1,500 neurons in monkeys just looking for recognition memory neurons. And we didn't find many responding, just when it was objects and a recognition memory task. 
But when we ask the monkey to do a task which we know is impaired by hippocampal damage, object and place memory, we then start to find uh, much more robust object cells. Okay? So this is interesting. The task that the monkey's doing um, can influence, can help to draw out object cells. So place or what spatial view cells will always be there in the monkey. But you do much better if you're looking for object cells if you make, put your monkey at least into a memory task. Okay, so that's the bottom line, and roughly we got 6% of object cells, 9.3% um, of spatial view, and 15% 15 uh, 15 of the combination. Object, would that mean it, would, it doesn't care where the object is? Yes, yeah. it does, correct. It's object independent of place, thanks. Okay, so um, then here's a task that Sylvia Wirth showed you yesterday. Uh, this is what we call a reward place task, okay? Um, so what happens here is we show a scene, and in this case, the neuron responds um, more to the greater reward in this location than it does to the smaller reward in that location. And again, more response to the greater reward. Now, we did a control, uh, which Haim wanted. Um, we did a reversal. So having um, <clears throat> found that, say, a neuron responded more um, to a location here because there's a high reward, we then switched it. So the monkey now got a high reward here, and the neurons switch. So it's not the scene. It's the place in the scene times reward association that's crucial for these neurons. Now here's something else that I think is terribly important for understanding the hippocampus. Um, <clears throat> we get nice responses if it's a hippocampal dependent task. Uh, in this case, place in a scene and reward. But if we just do a reward task with objects, so in this case, triangle, you get reward, salt, uh, sorry, a, squ uh, a, squ a square or something like that, you don't get a reward, then the, the neuron is not interested. Okay? So it's not interested in objects and rewards. We know where that's done. That's done in orbitofrontal cortex, um, which is an entirely different memory system, and I want to emphasize that. We've got lots of memory systems in our brain. Um, so here we are. Um, object um, or reward in a scene, okay? And this is just telling us something about uh, the percentage of the neurons that responded and that they actually reversed. Conclusion, um, most hippocampal reward place neurons um, don't respond in an object um, reward association task. Okay, right. Now, the fundamental thing for me for episodic memory is a one trial um, object place association. That's event memory. Where did I see a particular person? Okay? Uh, so here we are. We set up a one trial memory task. See if you can do it. Okay? Here's what you have to do I present an object in this location on the screen. Then I present an object in this location on the screen. Then I just present the object here, and you have to recall where the object had been seen on that trial. Yeah. Thank you. You're, you're very good. So the, the monkey could learn to do this. And the monkey could learn to do this whether we cued him for object to retrieve place, or we could put down stimuli, say, in this location, and ask him to retrieve the object. So we measured what hippocampal neurons do in this one trial, um, object, um, place, recall task. And so here's one neuron that responds more to object one than to object two at, in the first part of the task when the stimuli are present. But the most interesting thing is it consistently responds to object one even when here you're trying to retrieve the place, and there are no stimuli on the screen, okay? So, in other words, this neuron is responding to object one in the recall part of the task, 
even when um, there's no object one present. Um, what you've done is you've just queued the memory retrieval with the place. And so here's another neuron that does the converse. So this, in this case, you're rec retrieving the place from the object. And this neuron responds to, more to place one when the monkey's looking at place one, etc. Um, but the interesting thing is that throughout the trial, even when the stimulus is not present, um, the place and the monkey's doing the retrieval, um, you still get this increased firing. So um, this is evidence that these neurons are involved in one trial, object place recall, okay, which is the crucial thing. I mean, that's, we can call it episodic memory if we want, but that's the crucial hippocampal task as far as I'm concerned. So object place recall, um, and we got, um, I think these are the interesting ones, this 3.7 and 1.4. So it's a small proportion of neurons that are doing this recall, about 5% of hippocampal neurons. Conclusions. Um, <clears throat> well, this just summarizes some of the properties of um, spatial view cells. And <clears throat> there was an enormous silence in the literature for a long time. But then this year, at Society for Neuroscience, Sylvia, whose paper you heard yesterday, um, and Elizabeth Buffalo both gave posters which were talking about monkey hippocampal neurons that are responding to locations out there in the environment. Um, Sylvia's were a bit more complicated than Elizabeth's because many of Sylvia's were influenced by the, apparently the place where the monkey was, but it's very hard in a spatial navigation task, of course, to totally separate out where you are from where you're looking. And let me just make the point here. So if I'm in a big space like this and I look at some location over there, then the actual view is almost identical when I look here, okay? But if I'm in a small space, um, when I move my position, the view changes. So if you want to ever deconfound spatial view and place where you are, you have to be slightly careful, okay? And you in, in fact, you have to design an experiment to do that, which is what we did. Okay, why is all this important? Right, now look, none of you students have been up here yet, have you? Okay, so um, <clears throat> you can remember that I, I'm standing here. You've never been here. You could never do that with a rat place cell, but you could do it with a spatial view cell because all you have to do is look at this location out here in the world and remember it's Edmund here, okay? So that's the point. That's what your memory's like. You can remember things perfectly well um, for the place where you looked and that's what we, why we think you have these spatial view cells, okay? Right. Back then to how does it all work? How does it do this? So that's our anatomical diagram. In a little bit more detail, I'm going to go through this side this time, okay? So what we have is bits of neocortex up here with, which have superficial and deep pyramidal cells. Superficial pyramidal cell projects forwards up the cortical hierarchy and eventually gets to parahippocampal gyrus and perirhinal, which then projects into entorhinal cortex like this. So these solid lines are the forward projections. Um, so from uh, perirhinal, we then come down here into entorhinal cortex, okay? Entorhinal cortex then projects into dentate um, and also has an input directly to CA3. CA3 is the key part with these recurrent collaterals, the single network. And then CA3 projects on to CA1, which doesn't have recurrent collaterals. Um, the anatomy is fantastically important to designing your models. Uh, David Marr showed us that. Unfortunately, David didn't have much anatomy to help him, so he was never able to say, oh, it's CA3 or dentate doing something. Um, okay, so then from CA1, you're starting a back projection sequence to these cortical areas, first to enterhinal, but then enterhinal, deep pyramidal cells, have these dashed back projections which end um, on the superficial parts of the dendrite of neocortical pyramidal cells. 
And then this has back projections that come up here. Um, what's the back projection pathway for? Okay, let's think about that gradually. Okay, here's the anatomy. This is a monkey <coughs> from Gary Van Hosen. Um, this is um, a medial view of the brain, drawn the right up, way up. So that's the front, that's the back, that's the top, that's the bottom. Area 28 is entorhinal. So what this is showing you is the pathways coming in. This is, in, sorry, this is the lateral view of the brain, but Gary drew it upside down. So this is auditory uh, superior temporal cortex projecting in, um, visual high order projecting in, prefrontal projecting in, so many areas. It's the ends of every processing stream in the cortex project in to the hippocampus, and then, remarkably, there are back projections to all those areas. Okay? So that's the anatomy of the hippocampus. Um, it receives from the end of every processing stream and it sends back to every cortical processing stream. Now inside the hippocampus, here's the anatomy. Um, the entorhinal cortex, perforant path, comes in and makes synapses onto the dentate granule cells. There they are. The dentate granule cells then come along and make synapses onto the CA3 cells. Now the interesting thing here are the numbers. David Marr was right. The numbers are crucial. There are more mosses, that is synapses, in this diagram than in real life. In real life, there are about 14 synapses. Do you get this? Each dentate granule cell makes only 14 synapses with the CA3 cells, and there are 300,000 CA3 cells in the rat. So this is fantastically diluted connectivity. And I don't know if Haim, yesterday when he was telling us about, the forward, about random connectivity, was dealing with connectivity this diluted. But when it's this diluted, you get a very clear pattern separation effect. Let's have a look at it from the point of view of what a CA3 cell sees. CA3 cell has only 48, uh, 46 synapses on it devoted to these mossy fiber inputs. So can you see that these dentate granule cells, um, if say three of them are active, it takes about three being active to activate a CA3 cell, um, what's going to happen is that for one subset of the million um, dentate cells that happen to be on, you're going to be selecting a random subset of CA3 cells by these very, very diluted but very strong um, co connectivity systems by the mossy fibres. That's crucial to understanding what's going on. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, what's also crucial is this recurrent collateral system, the CA3 one. Now, I can't remember actually who drew this diagram, but it was in the earliest days, and uh, it didn't have a recurrent collateral on it, so I drew it on, because that's the key feature of the hippocampus, the CA3 recurrent collaterals. Um, and then these CA3 cells are shown projecting on to the uh, CA1 cells, which don't have recurrent collaterals, which then start the return uh, connection. Okay. So Sylvia, yesterday, showed us um, a single CA3 cell. So here's an earlier diagram by David Amaral. Um, so what David did was to fill this cell with um, HRP, horse radish peroxidase, and here's the dendrite of the cell. Uh, <clears throat> that's the receiving surface of the cell. Um, it's big, but the interesting thing is, here's the axon coming up here, and then there's another branch coming up here, and then the Schaefer collateral going on to CA1. Now what's remarkable about this is the following. This single cell is connecting potentially all the way to one end of CA3 and all the way to the other end. And it does that in the other plane too, anterior, posterior. So any one CA3 cell has a chance of making a connection 
with almost any other CA3 cell. Now, that's pretty true in the rat, but Kondo et al. Uh, had a look in the monkey and found it's even more global. That is, there's very, very little gradient depending on how far away the other cells are. So it's even truer in monkeys that these cells enable almost any one CA3 cell to contact any other one. And just to give you the, the, in, the intuitive understanding, if one of these cells is representing an arbitrary place and another cell is representing an arbitrary object, you have a chance of linking them. That's the point. You could never do that in neocortex because you've got all your spatial information up in parietal and all of your object information somewhere else um, in inferior temporal cortex. So that's what's key, that you're bringing everything into a single network. Hi. So if you look at, uh, at the probability of connections between two CA3 cells, they do not decrease with distance? Correct. That's what I'm saying. That's to the first approximation. You know, there's a very small gradient, but they don't decrease with distance. And the decrease you get is mild in the rat and less mild in the monkey. That is, it's more global in the monkey. Okay. Right. Now let's have a look at the numbers. Um, what are they telling us? Here we are, 300,000 CA3 cells in the rat, um, <clears throat> 46 mossy fiber inputs to each CA3 pyramidal cell. Uh, look at this number. The recurrent collaterals, 12,000, are received by each CA3 neuron. Look at the numbers. They're so different. That must be telling us something. And then 3,600 perforant path inputs. Okay? Just to help you, um, this, we think, then, is the randomizer which sets up, for any new memory, just a random set of CA3 cells, okay? Which random set it is, once they start firing, is learned by this other input that comes in from entorhinal cortex, the perforant path. So these synapses are HEB modifiable, and so once you have an arbitrary, very sparse subset of CA3 cells firing, you then learn which set it is using these synapses. And so later on, during recall, if you present just this, you can retrieve that set of CA3 cells, which go on to produce the output. Okay? That's the intuitive understanding of what's going on. Now, that's crucial. So Alessandro Treves and I, in I think it was 1992, published a paper which showed that you can't do retrieval with that small number of synapses. Um, and you can do the retrieval with that number. <clears throat> okay. This input is unique in the brain. It's the only bit of the brain which is acting as an orthogonalizing or decorrelating device. Um, <clears throat> everywhere else in the brain, the synaptic weights store the information that you have to remember. Here, because it's just an orthogonalizer, you can afford to stick in some new dentate cells if you want to, to perform a bit more orthogonalization. Um, <clears throat> and that's the only place in the brain for that reason that allows uh, neurogenesis, new neurons to be formed. If you did it anywhere else, you would simply be upsetting previous memories. But because all you're doing here is orthogonalizing, a few more is great, is the idea, okay? Right, now, auto-association memory. So it came to be called an attractor memory, but originally Cohonan did a lot of work on this class of memory, and he called it auto-association. And that makes clear what it's up to. So let me just, um, for anyone who doesn't quite fully understand one of these networks, make it clear why it's so good for object-placed memory, okay? So let's have an object on here, object one, and place one. During training, um, these two neurons would be firing. We have recurrent collaterals. And what you'll find is that this neuron has pre- and post-synaptic activity. So that synapse increases. And if you work it out, so does that one, so does that one, and so does that one. Um, that 
is the set of neurons that represent that object place combination. Of course, hundreds of cells in practice. Then, um, oh, and, and let's make it clear why this is called auto association. So what I've taken is a pattern, let's call it one for high firing, one, one, zero, zero. And now I turn the pattern around here and so that now I've got one, one, zero, zero. So what it's doing is associating the input pattern with itself. That's why it's called auto association, okay? And the important property of it is that if I now present, say, object one, coming around here through this strength and synapse, I retrieve place one, okay? Got it? And it works the other way around. If I present place one and it comes around here, I can retrieve object one. So that's an intuitive understanding of what's going on in an attractor memory. Now, it turns out that um, if you look at the statistical mechanics of this, um, which Hopfield did, John Hopfield, then you can work out how many, how many such memories you can have in the system. And that was very important. This just gives you another intuitive understanding of how it works. Here's a stored pattern. I think it's 20 out of 100 neurons. Um, here's the retrieval queue, a messy retrieval queue. Over a few discrete iterations, gradually I retrieve more and more of the correct pattern and squash out the incorrect parts of the pattern. And you would see all of this if you tried that software that I mentioned to you, those little programs, okay? Right. Now, um, here's an advance that Alessandro and I made. Um, so, uh, Haim went through this yesterday, so I'm not going to say much about this. But the number of patterns that you can correctly retrieve from an attractor network um, or auto-association network is C, the number of connections onto each neuron. Uh, RC just stands there for the recurrent collateral effect. So, so it's C divided by the sparseness, roughly. A is the proportion of neurons that are active for any one memory. So what this means is that if A is small, sparse, you can store and retrieve more patterns. And uh, uh, that was quite an important sort of advance in understanding that. So we calculate, for example, that uh, if you have 12,000 recurrent collaterals, as in the rat, and maybe 20 to 30,000 in monkeys, then, in humans, sorry, um, then with that level of sparseness, 0.02, which is possible, um, you find that the number of memories you can store and retrieve is 36,000, okay? Um, notice, it's nothing to do with the number of neurons in the network that sets the memory capacity, okay? That, that's so crucial. Now, let's now go into a little bit of the details of how this system would work in practice. Um, so you've got to do pattern separation uh, because, as Heim told us yesterday, any correlations in the input patterns have a severe effect on the memory storage capacity. So that's why we think you have these dentate granule cells in this bit of the brain, that, but nowhere else, because this bit of the brain is specialised for this one trial, um, unstructured event memory. Um, <clears throat> so it's pattern separation is a fundamental necessity. How is it done? A lot of mechanisms. Now, don't worry if you can't digest all of this. Um, it, it's all in that book. And there are hundreds of papers on my website that are going through this in more detail, OK? Uh, and incidentally, you'll be happy to know that I think the organizers of this winter school are going to provide everyone with copies of the slides, OK? So you can always go through them again. But here's what happens. There are lots of factors within CA3 which are important in helping the sparse representation. So strong inhibition. Uh, in CA3 helps to produce a very sparse um, representation by letting only a few neurons fire. Nonlinearity in the activation function is important. NMDA receptors are nonlinear. 
And so that means only the relatively fast firing neurons would store something, would show LTP. Um, as well as long term potentiation, um, it helps by having this heterosynaptic long term depression. So for Heim, the change of synaptic weight here is proportional to the postsynaptic firing times the presynaptic firing minus the average of the presynaptic firing is what that achieves for you. That's the important type of LTD. Now here we are. Do models make any predictions for experiments? Um, there's been quite a bit of work on LTD, but most people haven't focused on heterosynaptic. There's another type called homosynaptic. So here's a prediction. We need to know a lot more about heterosynaptic long-term depression in the brain because it's crucial for not only storage in auto-association nets, but also for what I'll describe in my second lecture, competitive learning involved in forming new representations. Question? Well, the thing is, like, I looked at LTD because we were writing a review and specifically LTD in vivo, and it's extremely hard to find anything about LTD in vivo. So it's mainly, like, the main field when it, where it's found is for, for instance, like, Mark Bear's, uh, like, experiments where he looks at the visual system. No, that's right. So it, it's been done. Um, so basically, um, one of the original experiments involved the um, contralateral input to CA3. And if you learn on one side of CA3, then the contralateral inputs from the other side of CA3 uh, get weaker. So you do get heterosynaptic LTD in the hippocampal system. All I'm saying is it needs to be explored a bit more. Okay? And that actually reminds me of something rather interesting. I was talking about something coming in from the other side. How many CA3 networks are there in the rat hippocampus? Actually, one. Um, <laughs> the inputs come in and cross so that the left and the right CA3s are even a single network because of the crossing over. Okay, quick question. You'll see in a minute. <laughs> okay, so um, the other thing that's important uh, is diluted connectivity in these systems. Um, here's the intuition. Hein didn't mention this yesterday. Um, <clears throat> if I have diluted connectivity in a network, then that decreases the probability that I would have two inputs um, from the same presynaptic neuron onto any postsynaptic neuron, okay? So um, what does that do? Well, say I had a single presynaptic neuron making two synapses onto a postsynaptic neuron. That would mean that I was distorting my basins of attraction. Some neurons would be pushing me into a deep basin. That distorts the memory space, and we showed, in fact I showed, that that has a severe um, influence, it impairs the memory capacity of an attractor network if you have double synapses for the recurrent collaterals. Doesn't matter elsewhere, if it's a forward input driving a neuron, that's okay. But for the recurrent collaterals, you have to be careful about double connections, I think, uh, because they would distort the basins of attraction. Okay, then there are some mechanisms in CA3 that work before you get to CA3 to do the pattern separation the dentate granule cells. So um, they perform pattern separation by competitive learning. I'll explain competitive learning a bit later. But basically it's a way of making a few neurons respond um, to a particular input because they compete with each other and after only a fewer firing, you then modify the synapses. And so it means that you're um, actually separating out patterns quite nicely. The mossy fibers, and I've given you um, an intuitive understanding of how that works and neurogenesis. And I've given you an intuitive understanding of how that works. 
I've also given you an intuitive understanding of why connectivity in attractor networks should be diluted. And actually, if you look at the numbers that Sylvia showed us yesterday, it's going to be even more diluted in humans, okay? Because you have more, many more, I think she said about 13 or 14 times more CA3 cells in humans than in rats. Um, but the, the in, increase in the number of synapses per neuron will only be an order of two or three. So the great diluted connectivity, I think, has this crucial function of helping you not to have double synapses and therefore impair your memory capacity. So everything seems to be set up to keep high memory capacity. Okay? Um, so that's one reason why um, I think the connectivity is so diluted. Okay? Right, so here's our diagram. And we've talked now a bit about this system and a bit about dentate, but we need to talk about the rest of the circuit. So dentate, I've more or less told you about, so I'm not going to go through that slide in much detail, except to say that here it is now, modelled as a competitive net. A competitive net has one set of inputs, one set of outputs. You apply this random connectivity, maybe this neuron, because of the random connectivity, responds more. It inhibits the others, and so this one responds even more the next time you present that particular stimulus. So it enables some neurons to win for some patterns and some for others. Now it turns out that if you have these enterhinal cortex grid cells, a cell that has high firing, high firing, high firing, high firing as you traverse an environment, that's hopeless for memory, okay, if you had to remember a place, because you would have um, increased high presynaptic activity for the place representation for hundreds of places. So you'd never be able to distinguish place. So you have to decorrelate effectively these grid cells. It turns out that a competitive network does that beautifully. So here we are. You can produce dentate granule cells, um, which are, have a very sparse representation um, just by using a competitive net. And um, <clears throat> then you find, in fact, that grid cells are present in primates. Um, this is the slide from uh, Elizabeth Buffalo, which showed grid cells. This is the monkey looking at a screen, and all she did was, she didn't know anything about uh, grid cells, you know, at the time, but she looked at her data later on after the monkey had been doing some sort of task looking around the screen, and she saw peaks of firing. Um, and so she said, oh, well, there are grid cells. That's what we predict. If you have spatial view cells in the primate hippocampus, there should be spatial view grid cells in enterhinal. And that's what she found, and they've been found in humans. Now, I've talked about this, the role of the mossy fibers. Right, pattern completion. So pattern completion occurs in the way I described in CA3. So I think you've got an intuitive grip of that. Now, here's a new twist on attractors. Um, basically, place is continuous. So a neuron responds with a Gaussian distribution to this place and another neuron with a Gaussian distribution to that place. Objects are discrete representations. An arbitrary set of neurons is active. So can I store both continuous and discrete representations in the hippocampus? So here we have a continuous representation for a thousand neurons. This would be a single neuron firing to location 300. And this would be a sing, um, and this would be, well, actually, this is a lot of neurons, but each one would have that profile. So the best firing neuron responds here, but other neurons respond with lower firing rates for slightly different places. This now is a discrete representation of an object, an arbitrary set of neurons firing for one object versus another object. Can a CA3 or a, a recurrent collateral network associate continuous and discrete representations. That would be necessary. And the answer we showed is yes, it can. And again, I'm not going to bother, because we're a bit short on time, to go through the details, OK? So that all works. Right, now here's an interesting issue for you. How fast does this system recall 
information. How fast does, what's the dynamics like? The way Heim was talking about yesterday, it sounded as if you had to go a set of, through a set of discrete time steps. Now that, you know, might take a long time if each time step took you 20 to 50 milliseconds. So we became very interested in this and we started to simulate, and also Alessandro Trevis did the analytic theory, of what would happen if you had integrate and fire neurons that then produce spikes. So this is continuous dynamics for the neurons. So everything is just in a state of low spontaneous activity. I suddenly put in an input. Uh, how long does it take for the attractor network to settle? Well, here's what's going to happen intuitively. Be because the neurons have spontaneous activity, some neurons will be close to threshold. Soon as I apply my input, within a millisecond probably, some of the neurons will be firing. They will, um, through their recurrent collaterals, be influencing other neurons. So you start the retrieval process. Ooh, is my microphone still on? Um, so you start the retrieval. Oh, I suspect the battery's gone down. Um, <laughs> You start the retrieval process within 20 milliseconds, sorry, within two milliseconds, and it's complete, we show, within about 20 milliseconds. So what we're actually doing here is altering the time constant of the synapses, okay, in the recurrent collateral system. And if the time constant is five milliseconds, it takes about 10 milliseconds to settle into its final basin of attraction. Um, and <clears throat> we showed that it's just that, nothing to do with the neuronal time constants, membrane time constants, just by altering the different synaptic time constants. And you can see it takes longer if you have um, a longer time constant, okay? So um, that makes the hippocampus potentially lousy for doing a discrete set of temporal sequence types of memory. Because if you tried to train into it a temporal sequence, as Heim did in a beautiful paper, by having slightly stronger forward weights between some neurons than backwards, then the whole system in retrieval would collapse into its attractor within 20 milliseconds. Okay? So this is fundamental to the whole of cortical computation. Um, if you take primary visual cortex going up to inferior temporal cortex, then each stage has recurrent collaterals, and it would only be possible to use these if each stage took about 20 milliseconds to settle. So we simulated the whole lot, and here's primary visual cortex, here's inferotemporal. Even when they're using the recurrent collaterals, you get a ripple through the whole system, which requires only 20 milliseconds per stage to even use the recurrent collateral. So that's incredibly important for understanding how the brain works. Vision can only work because we have a limited set of stages of the hierarchy, and because each stage takes only about 20 milliseconds for its computation. Okay, CA1. Right, CA1 has lots and lots of cells. I'll just go on for a minute and just finish this bit, okay. Um, uh, actually, should I show you this? Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> CA1 has lots and lots of cells, and um, basically um, we think acts as a competitive net, so that if you have an object and a place represented by separate neurons in your CA3, once they've become associated, you don't need to represent them separately anymore for the retrieval, so you form combination neurons, okay? And so that is part of the retrieval recoding. Okay, now I must mention these timing cells to you, which is a found, especially in CA1. So apart from um, helping with retrieval, CA1 appears to have some cells, according to Eichenbaum, that here's one cell which responds in a 10 second delay early on, another one a bit later, another one a bit later, and some a bit later. We now know that these cells are being generated in entorhinal cortex, uh, where you also generate the grid cells, and these are ideal for storing a temporal sequence of, say, objects or places. All I have to do is, with these neurons, associate with, say, this neuron 
a particular place that I have to take fifth or a particular object. So Ray Kessner, who's tested a lot of our theories with experimental work in the rat, has shown that um, if you have to go into the arms of a maze in a particular sequence, that's impaired by CA1 lesions especially. And we think this input from enterrhinal directly to CA1 is especially important in order um, short-term temporal memory, okay? Now look, back, this is the last bit I want to tell you. How do we get memories out of the hippocampus? It's no good leaving them in there and forming beautiful episodic memories. They have to come back. So what we find is that any pair of cortical areas have, from the deep layers, back projections. So here are the forward projections and here are the back. So it's a property of cortical architecture that it has back projections. Now, these back projections have the architecture of a pattern association memory in which I have a back projection, for example, coming in here and turning on the right neurons, which have been trained during the original learning by the forward inputs being associated with this back projected set of connections from the hippocampus. To make it really clear to you what's going on, in this pathway, what we've done is pattern separation here to help as a retrieval cue. And I'm going to be telling you how this set of back projections forms a pattern associator which retrieves the correct neurons in neocortex which have been trained originally by the forward input coming in here, rippling down to the hippocampus and then having the back projection here simultaneously <coughs> present when the forward input during the original learning is driving that cell. I mean that's one reason why the storage of memory takes a little while, Simon because you have to learn at at least one stage of the back projection pathways um, which back projection from the hippocampus is associated with what's driving that cell so you can do the retrieval operation, okay? Right, so how does it all work? Well, um, <clears throat> it's a way of unloading the memory. How, how does it actually work? Well, um, <clears throat> if you look at this, architecture, um, how are you going to measure the memory capacity of this multi-stage hetero associator? So Alessandro had a brilliant thought just before Christmas one year. He said, look, this retrieval process, a multi-stage hetero associator, is analogous to the first iteration here, you go round once, and then you would go around a second time. It's like going around once here and going around a second time. So exactly the same theory applies to a multi-stage hetero associator as applies to an attractor net. And so we were able to calculate the memory capacity of the back projection pathways. And it turns out that it's the same equation. The number of patterns you can retrieve in the back projections depends on the number of connections per neuron onto each neuron in those back projecting synapses coming onto the superficial uh, parts of the dendrites of the neocortical pyramidal cells, okay? Um, and divided again by the sparseness, but now in the back projection pathway. Right, now, can anyone now explain to me why we have as many back projecting <coughs> fibers <coughs> between any pair of cortical areas as forward projections, okay? Why would that happen? <clears throat> well, you have to have as many back projections so that you can retrieve the number of memories you can store in the hippocampus, okay? So that's the only explanation I know <clears throat> of why you have as many back projections between any pair of cortical areas as forward projections, that you have to retrieve a large number of memories. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the synapses w have to be sort of head modifiable. Okay, so that's how we think the system works. Um, just a little note, the hippocampus of the monkey is more sparse in its spatial and other <coughs> representations than neocortex by a factor of two. This, we think, 
is an underestimate. Um, it's, it's sparser than that because we only measure in one environment. In a rat, if you move the rat to another environment, you tend to get many new cells firing and many of the old ones from the first environment don't, sell, don't fire. So actually, because we only used one room, our sparseness representation, in fact, will be lower than that and closer to what Rodrigo finds in humans. Okay, so there you are. I think that's the theory that I wanted to describe to you. That's really a sort of whole theory of how the hippocampus might work and might enable you then to store information originating from these areas in your hippocampus on the fly in an unstructured way, no thinking about it, no semantic business at all. And later on, when you see a spatial cue, to retrieve it back up so that you would reinstate the same neurons firing in your, say, inferotemporal cortex that had been present in the original memory, and vice versa, so that you could retrieve back to neocortex that representation. So that's actually where I'm going to stop this lecture. Okay, so that was my theory of how all of this works. I'll stop there.